Hi, in this video, we take a look at the method of finite differences, a numerical method widely used to solve engineering problems. Together with a finite volume element and a finite element method, it is one of the most popular numerical methods available. The finite differences method is used to solve more precisely differential equations, that is, equations where we try to find a function satisfying a given relation containing its derivatives. Maybe it would pay off to remember the definition of the derivative. The derivative of a function f at x is defined by this limit. Computers restricted to arithmetical operations can take limits, so we can't use the definition directly, but we could approximate the value of the derivative considering small delta x's. Well, this formula is the basis for the finite differences method. But how good of an approximation is it really? The answer to this comes in two parts. First, we expect that as delta x becomes smaller, our approximation will get closer and closer to the value of the derivative at that point. Such approximation is said to be consistent. Ours clearly is, since we end up in the definition of the derivative using a limit if we let delta x go to zero. Second, yes, the smaller the delta x, the better the approximation. But how much better? Say we decrease the delta x by 10. What improvements in our approximation can we expect? To communicate this information, we use the big O notation. You probably have seen it around. It is widely used in computer science to tell us how the number of operations in an algorithm grows with the number of elements. In our case, it roughly means that as x goes to zero, after some point, f is always smaller than g. Well, the strategy we use to find our formula doesn't really tell us how accurate it is. We must use a different approach. Let's consider the Taylor expansion of f at x. We can rewrite it in order to the derivative of f. The extra terms in this expression are big O of delta x, so our formula is first order accurate meaning that if we decrease the delta x by tenfold, we can expect more or less a tenfold decrease in our error. This formula is the so-called forward difference, but we have more options. Consider again the Taylor expansion of f at x, but now compute the value of f at x minus delta x. We now find a different formula for the derivative. This is the so-called backward difference formula. Unfortunately, it is also only first-order aggregate. Could we do better? In fact, we can. Just subtract the two Taylor expansions we used to find the forward and backward formulas. Rewriting to find the derivative of f, we find a formula for the central difference. And lo and behold, it is second-order aggregate. So, if we decrease the delta x by 10, we expect roughly a hundredfold decrease in the error of our approximation. We can also apply a similar rationale to the second derivative. But now we add the two Taylor expansions. After some rearranging, we find the central difference approximation to the second derivative, which is also second order accurate. These formulas are called three point formulas, as they only use three points or less. There are five point formulas and so on, which are more accurate. But the most common approach when we desire a more accurate result is to choose a smaller delta x. However, keep in mind that this can lead to rounding errors and we must take some care to avoid going overboard with the decrease in delta x. With the tools we have found so far, we can start solving some problems. Consider the equation describing heat conduction through a rod of length L, thermally isolated from the sides, with thermal conductivity K and an internal heat source Q per unit length. The temperature is denoted by phi. The temperature at the end point of the rod is fixed. We introduce some notation to ease the application of our formula to the problem. Assume that the rod is divided by a grid where the nodes are separated by delta x. So, Instead of writing the argument of the function, we just write as a subscript the index of the point in the grid. We need to pause for an instant to reflect on an important detail. The finite differences method, given a delta x, only allows us to determine the temperature at the points of the grid. If we want the temperature outside the grid, we will have to interpolate, in some way, 
between the points in the grid. We could use any of the formulas we have found, but it makes more sense to use the most accurate one. That said, applying our formula at each point of the grid, not on the boundary, we find a linear equation in the values of phi at the grid points. For the nodes at the boundary, we already have two equations, so we have found n equations and we have n unknowns. Now we just need to solve the system of equations to find the temperature of the rod at the different grid points. What if instead of prescribing a temperature at the boundary, we have prescribed a heat flux? From Fourier's law, we have that the heat flux is proportional to the gradient of the temperature. Of course, we would lose an equation enforcing the temperature at the boundary, and we would have to find a new one. We can use the backward difference to approximate the gradient at the boundary points, yielding the boundary equation we were looking for, and producing again a system of n equations with n unknowns. But now our approximation at the boundary is only first order accurate. Is there a way to make it second order accurate? Well, yes there is. Consider an artificial extra point next to the boundary. Apply the central difference for the second order derivative at the boundary and discretize the boundary condition using the central difference for the first derivative. Voila! We now have two more equations and one more unknown. The temperature at the fictitious point. That is, we have a system of n plus 1 equations and n plus 1 unknowns, where the boundary conditions are approximated using a second order accurate formula. This is a first peek into the method of finite differences. We saw what are the formulas for the forward, backward and central differences and how accurate they are. We also got to apply it to a simple engineering problem, the heat conduction through a rod, and saw how the differential equations are transformed into a system of algebraic equations which are able to be solved by a computer. In the next video we will take a look at how to apply these concepts to solve problems in more than one dimensions. There will be three videos on the topic. A first, where we explore the main idea of the method and apply it to a 1D problem. A second, where we will see how to tackle a problem in more dimensions than one, taking a look at different examples describing physical problems. And finally, a third, where we will see how to solve some challenges that come up when applying the finite differences method to more complex problems. See ya!